in the meantime, feel free to use the chat for that. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Frank Rahel is a professor at University of Wyoming, and he'll be talking about applying the RAD framework to managing invasive species in a changing climate. So I'll pass it over to you, Frank, for your screen share. All right, thank you. Let me get my screen up here. Okay, um, is everybody seeing a screen that has uh, a invasive fish species about to enter a, a new environment? Yes, it looks perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and let me just close this a little bit here. So <clears throat> natural resource managers have recently been developing a framework for managing ecosystems in the face of climate change. And we've been referring to it as the resist, accept, or direct framework, sometimes abbreviated as RAD. So I'm gonna talk about that today and particularly talk about how it might be related to managing invasive fish species. So this framework is based on the idea that we have three options when faced with a changing climate conditions. Um, if we start here with the historical conditions, we can, without any intervention, our system will move to a new state. And we can try to resist that change by doing various things that try to maintain what had been in the past, or maybe restoring back to some historical condition. That's one option. Another option is to simply accept that things are changing and not try to resist, but simply live with the new environment and do the best we can managing the new system. But there's a third option, and that's the direct option, and this is probably the most innovative part of this RAD framework, is that are there things we can do that will move the system into some new set of conditions that would be desirable by humans? So those encompass all the options that managers have, resist, accept, or direct. Oftentimes, the first reaction is resist. Try to maintain things the way they had been in the past. Here's an example with a stream. Um, if this stream is warming due to climate change, it may be becoming unsuitable for trout. We can try to rehabilitate the riparian zone, add more vegetation, plant trees, keep cattle grazing out, and then try to restore it to what had been the historical condition. But at some point, resistance is going to be futile. If things are changing beyond what we can reasonably expect to uh, reverse. And so that's where the other two options become uh, of consideration, accept or direct. And I'm going to be talking about them specifically in the context of aquatic environments and, and how we might manage for changes in the fish assemblage. So fisheries managers have historically had four major tools available to them, and those involve uh, stocking, and this could be introducing new species to a system or supplemental stocking of species that are already there. Managers can invoke regulations to try to affect changes in size structure or the abundance of fish populations. Managers can do habitat improvements uh, to try to increase the carrying capacity or the uh, particular species of interest. Or we can do what I've called community manipulations. Uh, let's say that we're interested in a particular species, this one here. Well, we might go and manipulate the predators of that species or the competitors of that species in order to promote the species of interest. And so we're manipulating at a community level. And so I'm interested in how those fit into this resist, accept, and direct framework. So we can create a table. We've got our three options, resist, accept, and direct top in our four management tools, stocking, regulations, habitat improvement, and community 
manipulations at the bottom. And I won't have time to go through all of this. I have a manuscript now that's in press. If someone's interested, they can get in touch with me and I'll share it with you. But let's just pick out some of these quadrants here that deal with managing invasive species. And I'm going to start with the idea of doing some habitat improvements that fall under the accept strategy. So we're going to accept that the environment has changed. But one of the things we might be able to do is restore connectivity. Uh, think of a stream system that's been fragmented by dams, roads, for example, to allow access uh, to refugia during, say, heat waves or during uh, periods when the stream is dried up, and then allow recolonization. <coughs> and in fact, this idea of restoring connectivity is a major emphasis of a lot of stream management these days. It can involve getting rid of barriers, taking down old dams. It can involve putting in fish ladders, essentially an aquatic stair step way that allows organisms to move up and down. Well, this is great for the species uh, that we're trying to manage that are desirable, but it also means that undesirable species are now also going to be able to move through the environment. And here's an example. It involves a species called brown goby, which is an invasive species in the Great Lakes, particularly in Lake Erie. And it had been prevented from moving very far up into the Ottawa River <coughs> by a dam, the Secor Dam. But that dam was removed, and therefore these invasive fish species were able to move upstream and cause harm to the native fishes. So that's a double-edged sword getting rid of uh, barriers and promoting comic. <coughs> Let's take a look down here <clears throat> under uh, community manipulation that falls under the resist category. <clears throat> so we might try to prevent, extirpate, or suppress an invasive fish species. Let's take a look at how we might do that. Well, one of the things we could do is simply ban those undesirable species from being present in an area. For example, in Northern Pike, um, you are prohibited, excuse me, in Washington, you are prohibited from having northern pike in your possession. And moving them from one area to another can result in a $5,000 fine or, or even a year in prison. So we definitely don't want people moving pike and establishing them in new areas, so we'll just ban their possession, keep them out of the uh, regional species pool. Another is through surveillance and early control measures. An example there is boat inspections for invasive species, particularly things like the zebra mussel. Uh, before you can launch your boat in many Western waters, you have to have it um, inspected and make sure it doesn't have these invasive species. If it does, then you undergo a process of decontamination as shown here. Well, let's suppose the species has become established, we might take an approach of extirpating that invasive species. A good example involves uh, brook trout as an invasive species in the Western US. Oftentimes we're trying to protect native cutthroat populations. And one of the things we can do is poison out particular water bodies. These are some people applying a rote known poison. They would have removed the desirable species, put them somewhere safe, and then poison out the undesirable species and then restock later. Typically, this is a very labor-intensive and expensive procedure, and it usually involves putting some kind of a barrier downstream so that the invasive species cannot recolonize. Or we might simply suppress populations, we recognize that we can't get rid of them, but maybe we can at least reduce their populations and therefore their negative effects. That can be done through mechanical removal, which means netting them out, in this case, electrofishing, get rid of the undesirable species, or here's a particularly innovative way of outsourcing that control. In the Columbia River Basin, there's a bounty on northern pike minnow, which is a predator on native trout species. And it can actually earn money uh, by catching some of these pike minnow and turning them into a uh, nearby game and fish office. And they even have some tagged fish worth up to $500 each to encourage people to get out there. So pretty in innovative way of uh, using the public to help with suppression invasive fish species. The other thing we might do is intentionally fragment the system to prevent colonization. So this is the reverse 
where we've talked about enhancing connectivity. And here's a uh, Gabion uh, barrier that was put on the, um, the Barge Creek in Wyoming. There are native cutthroat upstream. There are invasive brook trout and rainbow trout downstream. And the upstream area was uh, reclaimed with rout known and been restocked with native fish. And so far, this barrier has been successful in preventing the recolonization. Uh, here's a, another example. Uh, this is on the, uh, on the, in the Gunnison River. And we've got a fish ladder that circumvents a barrier. Fish can travel up this, and then they get caught in a holding tank up here. And then biologists can periodically go through and sort. They can put the desirable species back in the river, let them continue upstream, and they can remove the undesirable species from the system. So this is sort of the ultimate in having your cake and eat it too. We've, we've fragmented the system against invasive species, but we're promoting connectivity for desirable species. And then an example under the accept category is simply promote the use of non-natives that are favored by climate change. If they're going to be there, are there things we can do to utilize them for the benefit of humans uh, and maybe in the process control their populations to a certain extent. An example here would be the common carp, which for 150 years has been considered to be a very undesirable species in aquatic systems in North America. But we now have a, a carp society that promotes fishing, uh, both recreational and for consumption of carp. And in fact, you can even book fly fishing trips to go and fish for carp. Uh, they're quite large and they're, they put up a good fight. So some people are very interested in them as a recreational species, in fact. And if you're willing, you can pay up to $425 a day to have a guided carp trip. And then one of the more recent uh, twists to all this is to become an invasive or what is an invasive or well, it's something, it's a person who eats an endangered species. And um, this uh, picture here has a caption of eradication by mastication, uh, which is probably uh, overselling the idea. I don't know that we're really going to uh, eradicate, but at least we might put a control in. An example where this is actually working um, are for lionfish, which have invaded the southeast of the United States, but are also very good eating. And so we've been promoting them and restaurants now serve them. There are um, spear fishing derbies and fishing events where people are encouraged to go out and harvest them and, and make good use uh, of them as a fish. So that's an overview of this framework called RAD, which is the subject of many publications recently, and how it might be applied in managing invasive species in a changing climate. So I'll turn it back over to our host. Great, thank you so much, Frank. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we'll move right along to our next speakers. We'll have Dr. Jeff Morissette and Dr. Taylor Wilcox. Uh, Jeff is the Director of Human, the Human Dimensions Program at the U.S. Forest Service, and Taylor is a Research Geneticist at the U.S. Forest Service. Okay, I'll dig in. I'm going to start it off. And uh, again, I'm Jeff Morissette. Thanks a lot to the North Central Risk for having this workshop and for uh, allowing us to present this material and uh, for all the participants listening in to learn about it. Uh, Stosh Bertel covered uh, the, what the National Invasive Species Council was in the previous panel, but it's coordinating uh, invasive species activities across the federal government. And indeed, part of the 2020 work plan for the uh, for NISC was to explore how eDNA could be used for invasive species management, uh, especially in terms of surveillance and detection. And a lot of the work focused, and a lot of this talk will talk will focus on aquatics, uh, but it can be used in terrestrial environments. But uh, uh, again, for this talk, it'll be mainly on uh, on an aquatic environment. So uh, next slide, I think we're going to talk about. I'll talk about. I'll think about the first uh, uh, third of the talk and then hand it over uh, to, to Taylor to do some uh, some to provide some exciting examples of the use of eDNA. So my overview is going to talk about two issues related to environmental DNA. And these were kind of the main two issues covered in the in that task team and a resulting paper was that um, it can be extremely sensitive and it's pretty complicated. So on the sensitive uh, note, next slide, I think I'll animate to be like thumbs up. We got uh, detection and true positive. I don't know if you can click to that, I'm not seeing it, but it's that upper left uh, 
uh, element of this error matrix. There we go. Uh, it shows that you know it's really incredibly sensitive to detecting any uh, any trace of a species. And so this can be really powerful in migrating climates and sort of that uh, we're just hearing about uh, accepting or directing, you know, as, as species might move into new systems under climate change, environmental DNA would be a way to watch for those species and to detect them even when they're hardly, uh, they're either cryptic species or hardly present or it's hard to detect them in or kind of get to some places where they might be. The downside is, so the next slide shows that eDNA is not going to distinguish between some remnant of a dead uh, 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 shed uh, uh, elements of that species uh, in the environment. It'll look at it, it'll find it there, the eDNA will be present. And it's a whole spectrum of that to you know, a very viable or growing population. So the managers left to decide with a positive from environmental DNA, uh, how much is really there and is it a threat? And then kind of temper their management actions uh, relative to uh, that understanding. So the next slide shows kind of like, I just grabbed some slides off the internet, how complex it is with the genetic markers and the analysis. And sort of, I think the task team sort of landed on really important to get some solid partners who, who, who are gonna understand those technical details. And that's from sampling and making sure your containers where you're collecting it are clean thoroughly, how you transport it, what might be happened or contaminated or lost and transport to a lab where genetics are being done. Indeed, there's some uh, genetics techniques that are being done in the field, and those are pretty exciting too. But again, there's, it's pretty highly technical and should rely on uh, kind of some partners who understand uh, that the, the, the practitioners uh, with uh, genetics and environmental DNA. Next slide shows kind of the uh, figure from the paper that we wrote and kind of asked these four major questions. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you know, why should eDNA e e be used? There's a lot of examples where it's proven to be very sensitive and very effective. There's also considerable federal and international investments and the paper has a table of what's being done uh, with those investments or kind of articulating and explicitly listing those investments and those programs. And indeed, well, you'll hear about the National Genomics Center here in a little bit. Uh, but uh, next slide, so then any the other three questions were kind of addressed uh, uh, question at a time with the flow diagram, and it was more complicated than this flow diagram in the paper, but this is my little cartoon to show that we kind of made kind of the goal. This is the what question it's looking to answer and where you end up as you answer that question. And we color coded the workflow to, dis to distinguish what should be, what are the manager's issues and responsibilities to address in that workflow? What are the technical issues that, that uh, those genetic practitioners should be a part of? And then uh, what are steps that need coordination between the two? And so uh, you'll see in the paper that these are, they're fairly complex workflows, but uh, we thought it was a handy way to articulate it based on those four questions, moving through those and then saying, what's management, what's the practitioner and where do both people have to come together on that? Uh, next slide, I think just kind of summarizes here to say that this is the paper, uh, it's, a, it's open access. Um, and then yeah, the next slide is is sort of like, okay, strategic considerations for using eDNA, maybe we should think about a phase two. I don't know if Stash is still on the line, but NIST could, could coordinate or, or, or an, the, the, the risk network could think about cons strategic considerations of eDNA as a surveillance tool in a changing climate. Because I think as things do migrate, move in or out, uh, eDNA might be useful to do that. But with that, I'll hand it over to, to see some uh, exciting examples relative to using uh, eDNA in the, genetic, the National Genomics Lab. Thanks, Jeff. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep. And Good thanks, Jeff, me. for your patience with my messy slide transition. <laughs> um, so uh, I was originally introduced. I'm Taylor Wilcox, and I'm a research geneticist in the National Genomics Center for Wildlife and Fish Conservation. And my hope is to provide the National Genomics Center as a specific example of a federal agency that's been engaged with eDNA sampling with management partners, and then give an even more specific um, example of how we've used eDNA sampling to understand uh, a climate change and invasive species issue for our native population. So quick overview, National Genomics Center is nested within the Rocky Mountain Research Station in the US Forest Service. We work with partners, both federal, state, tribal, non-governmental industry and academic to analyze about 5,000 to 10,000 eDNA samples annually. And this includes eDNA sample analysis for invasive species surveillance, for monitoring the extent of known populations of invaders and for uh, assessing eradication efficacy. Um, a core part of the National Genomics Center that's referenced in the paper that Jeff introduced, kind of a piece of infrastructure in his pyramid diagram, is the Aquatic eDNA Atlas database 
This is an online publicly accessible database that pulls together about 22,000 analyses from across the United States built up from partnership um, with over 100 different partners. But what I'm going to talk today is something that is behind this public database that you can see online, and that's the physical archive of samples. Sometimes we call this the eDNA archive. And so after we've collected an environmental sample, we extract the DNA, we do an analysis, there's still more of that sample left, and we can essentially keep that in a freezer in perpetuity. Um, you can dig up sediments uh, that are thousands of years old and still find DNA from, uh, from ancient megafauna. So we, we know that that DNA is going to be stable for a long period of time. And I kind of like to think of these eDNA samples as biological times capsules. Once we've got them preserved well, we can go back and we can do new analyses on them. And this allows us to pretty inexpensively repurpose our samples. So that is do new analyses really cost effectively compared to doing a whole new sampling effort. Um, there's the potential that if we keep these samples for long periods of time that we could reconstruct historical conditions, which could be useful in the future. And just in general, it opens up the avenue for us to apply new tools as they're developed to our old samples, as long as we're intentional with our archival. So today I'm in a specific case study of how that physical archive of samples in an intentional way can allow us to ask questions about invasive species climate change. I'm gonna focus on the range-wide bull trout eDNA project. <clears throat> this was a sampling effort working with dozens of partners um, to collect thousands of samples across headwater habitats in the upper Columbia basin to clarify the distribution of bull trout populations and headwater habitats. Um, specifically with, with a mind to understand how climate change impacts might affect these uh, populations and it might affect uh, yeah, their future distribution in these habitats. A natural follow-up to that after we collected this data set though was to ask how might invasive species influence the response of bull trout to predicted climate changes. The invasive species that's going to immediately come to mind in these systems are invasive eastern brook trout, they're closely related to bull trout. They have a high niche overlap with bull trout. They're really ecologically similar. Um, and there's been multiple studies shown that they, uh, they can outcompete bull trout under certain habitat conditions. And so for this work, we focused on about a 10,000 square kilometer basin um, in Western Montana, where we had 630 eDNA sampling locations for bull trout. Those are shown here where white dots are places where we did not detect bull trout DNA and black points are where we did detect bull trout DNA. And because we had these samples physically archived in an intentional way, it just took two weeks in the lab to generate an overlaying distribution of brook trout. So now we're using a color ramp to indicate concentration of brook trout DNA ranging from gray with zero DNA to red being a lot of DNA. And then because of the design of the eDNA Atlas sampling scheme, we can quickly tie each of these sampling locations to the National Hydrography data set and to predictions from the Norwest project so that we have predicted um, stream temperatures at a one kilometer resolution across the entire basin. And we have predictions of how these stream temperatures and flow conditions might change in the future due to climate change. So this sets us up really well to ask where are bull trout now, where are brook trout, how are both climate change and brook trout um, shaping the distribution of bull trout in the landscape right now, and how might the distributions change in the future as these two kind of threats, climate change and invasive species, interact with each other. So I'm going to focus on just some images of the data and skip over some of the mixed modeling that we did. But on the last slide, I'll have a, a picture of the paper. And you can also reach out to me for um, information on that, that uh, Google Drive sheet that was shared during the break. All right, so here we're going to look at the habitats that we sampled and we're plotting in ecological space. So on the x-axis is our mean summer temperature, on our y-axis is our mean summer flow, and then each of these black points, there's 630 of them, is each of our um, sampling location, locations plotted in environmental space. And we're using color to indicate the density of these points to make it a little easier to see. So you can see this red blob here at the bottom, those kind of tend to be a little bit lower flow, um, intermediate temperatures are where most of our habitats are. Now I'm gonna look at where we actually detected bull trout using the same kind of plotting format. All right, so same axes, but now we're using these colors to indicate regions of environmental space that are overrepresented in red or underrepresented by bull trout detections um, across this sampled area. And what you can see is that bull trout are preferring slightly higher temperature and higher flow habitats. They're avoiding these really low flow habitats. So let's put a little ellipse around this region of environmental space that seems to be preferred by bull trout. And let's look what happens when we add brook trout into the system. 
When there's brook trout too, you see this shift. Bull trout tend to move to colder temperatures and only persist at these higher flow habitats. And so it looks like brook trout might be displacing bull trout from some of their preferred habitats. And in fact, that's consistent with what we see when we look at habitats that only have brook trout. So these would have been suitable for bull trout, but we're only finding brook trout in them now. Here you can see there's this red blob down in these really low flow streams. And this makes sense with our understanding of the ecology of these species, previous studies that have found that brook trout tend to outcompete bull trout in small stream habitats. Okay, so why does stream habitat size matter? It matters because most of the habitats on this landscape are pretty small. So in blue and in red here are all of the thermally suitable habitats for juvenile bull trout, but red are the only ones that are greater than 10 cubic feet per second. And for reference, that's this dotted line right here going across the, from the y-axis. And so it will be interesting to think from here about how available are these high flow habitats going to be in the future under different climate change scenarios. So let's look at this plot again, and now we're gonna look at climate change predictions. So let's put an ellipse around this region of environmental space where bull trout seem to be able to hold their ground despite brook trout invasion. This is our current um, distribution of habitats um, that we sampled uh, in, the, in this basin under historical conditions. And then this is what's predicted for 2040. You can see that we're predicted to have these, temp these temperatures go up and flows in the summer to decline. And this is the prediction for 2080. We have almost no habitats left within this region of environmental space. So the overall conclusion from this work was that invasive so brook trout may constrain the ability of bull trout to track their climatic niche in the future. That is, bull trout um, may not be able to persist in those small stream habitats that are thermally suitable, um, that may be the only ones that stick around as thermally suitable due to climate change if there are brook trout invaders there and has important consequences for how we think about management action, both for invasive species and for habitat restoration moving into the future. And more generally for this talk, I hope that this is an example of how thoughtful eDNA sample archiving, like we do for the eDNA Atlas and underlying eDNA archive, can allow us to ask questions that were previously unaccessible. And with that, I'll just say thanks and uh, save questions uh, for the end period. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Taylor and Jeff. Really interesting talk. Um, just for the sake of time, we'll move right along to Dr. Janet uh, Prive, who's a research ecologist at the USGS. And Janet will be talking about predicting risk of plant invasion following wildfires in the Western United States. So we'll pass it over to Janet. Thanks. Oh, Jeff or Taylor, could you stop sharing your screen? Are you still seeing their screen? No screen share right now. So I think you're, you're good to go share. Am? You see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Not yet. Oh. It says I'm sharing my screen, but maybe I should try it again. Yeah, now we can see it's uh, the whole PowerPoint um, view. Oh, no, okay. the slide's great. Okay, okay, sorry, it might be a lag or something. Um, you'd think I would know how to use Zoom by now. Anyways, thanks for the introduction. I'll be talking about uh, this project that was funded through the USGS Risk Research and Applications Group last year. And there's a large number of people involved in this project. I'm the one talking, but this is really uh, a huge group effort. So I um, probably don't have to tell you guys much about this, but oh, sorry. Um, we know that the size and severity of wildfires across the country has grown in recent years. Um, and this has led to an increased risk of non-native plant invasion following these disturbances, right? And many of these invasive plants, cheatgrass being kind of the poster child, can further increase the risk of large and severe wildfires leading to this invasion fire cycle that can really be very damaging for native ecosystems as we've seen in sagebrush steppe and other cold desert ecosystems. So managers would like tools um, to help them figure out the regions that are at high risk for plant invasion after wildfire now and also in the future. Um, and we're hoping that this work can sort of be a step in the right direction for them. 
Um, and this research project had kind of the overly ambitious goal at the outset of looking at, sorry, my dog is crying. Come on on, dog. She wants to talk too. Um, looking at how, or looking at post fire invasion risk across the entire country. Um, and to do that, we're using nationwide plant monitoring data, um, pairing that with fire perimeter and severity data, and also looking at how environmental um, and climatic factors influence the cover of invasive plants measured in plots after fires. And then the lofty goal of this project is um, to identify where invasions are most common following fire and create a mapping tool that can help inform current and future management. All right, so I'm briefly going to describe some of the um, our key data sources. Our response variable for these analyses is um, plot level percent cover of non-native plants, and we're piggybacking over a uh, we're piggybacking on a large effort to standardize a lot of the plant monitoring data taken across the country called the Standardized Plant Community with Introduced Status Database. Um, and this is a really great resource that will hopefully be publicly available soon. It's still in preparation. And the largest source of plant, plant cover data from this database comes from the BLM assessment inventory and monitoring data. You can see these plots here in green. The BLM plots, we also have data from the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and in conjunction with this, we've formed data sharing collaborations with many different researchers, all listed on that first slide. And here's some of the logos from their different agencies. People who have taken a targeted post-fire plant cover data uh, for many different reasons and different experiments, and we've added them to this data set. And to that, we're still looking for more data for these sort of large scale analyses. So if you happen to have any plant abundance or cover data that you would be willing to share um, in the continental US, let me know. My email is there, or you can add a question in the Zoom. Um, and so we're taking this plant cover data from plots, and then we're extracting those plots that were measured after fires. And we're determining that using the um, MTBS database, as well as this recently released combined wildland fire data set for the United States. Um, and there's the DOIs for both of those. And then we're looking at how um, environmental data, most specifically climate data from the Climate NA program, um, relates to percent cover of non-native plants after fires. We're also looking at soils data, a number of different soil factors, topography, land cover, um, ecoregion, and then gridded management history data. And we are still really in the early stages of these analyses. Um, it turns out organizing and cleaning this amount of data takes way longer than one ever plans for. But um, I'd like to quickly share some of our preliminary results so you can at least see what direction we're headed in. And I'm just going to focus on the Western US here, because um, that's where the North Central region is. And it's also where the majority of large fires have occurred in the past. And most of our monitoring data come from uh, public lands in the West. So our current data set um, has over 45,000 vegetation plots that are located in the Western US. And over 8,000 of these plots were burned prior to measurement. So those 8,000 plots, data from those plots is what we're focusing on. Um, and the majority of the plots were measured between 2014, 2018. And the majority of the plots um, have pretty low cover of non-native species. Um, a lot of plots have zero cover or less than 1%. So it's good to know that the whole West isn't already invaded after fires. Um, and then uh, we have found that monitoring plots that were measured after they were burned, shown in brown here, overall have a higher uh, mean cover of non-native species, as you might expect when compared with unburned plots. Um, but you can see this map that varies a lot from plot to plot. There's a lot of variability in the data here. Um, and it also varies by plant functional group. So we divided uh, non-native plant cover into a bunch of different sort of non-native functional groups. 
And again, this probably won't come as a surprise to anyone, but the majority of the non-native plant cover after fires in the Western US is made up of these short-lived grominoids, which is cheatgrass, other winter annual grasses like that. Um, and then you can see comparing this to the total plant cover, it really is the majority of the post-fire plant cover. And if you just focus at or focus on the environmental factors that are correlated with high cover of these non-native annual grasses after fires, we found that summer precipitation and drought variables were the most important predictors of post-fire non-native grass cover across all of the different ecoregions in the West. Um, and these relationships remain consistent even if you just focus on sage, sagebrush steppe ecosystems or if you remove those ecosystems from the, the analyses. Um, and these are scatter plots of four of the most important climate predictors here with the cover of the short-lived grasses on the y-axis. Um, and the lines in these graphs are just kind of smooth means to show you the patterns. They're not derived from model fits. Again, this is all very preliminary. Um, however, I think these preliminary results indicate that there is a clear climate space where non-native grass invasions after fire are more likely. And, uh, can be more damaging as shown by the higher cover of non-native grasses in that climate space. Um, and if these invasion hotspots are closely tied to climate, it also means that the regions where non-native and grass invasions will be most damaging in the future could shift with climate change, right? Um, and these are just some projections of changing in climatic moisture deficit by the mid and end of the century. And you can see an increase in drought for the North Central region, especially by the end of the century. Um, and this shift in invasion hotspots is likely already occurring, right? I know managers and higher elevation sagebrush steppe ecosystems are dealing with annual grasses, annual grass invasions that were not prevalent there in the past. And in foothills ecosystems and ponderosa pine forests in the North Central region, you can have really notable um, cheatgrass invasions after fire, as some of the other speakers talked about. Um, and I just put in this time series of photos for the Cheeseman Reservoir. Um, the last one taken 16 years after the Hayman fire, but not showing uh, really any signs of new tree growth. To just kind of emphasize that even though ecosystems were forested in the past, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll be forested in the future. Um, and focusing on these changing ecosystems and where the risk of conversion to non-native plant communities, especially non-native annual grass communities, is most likely is probably really important. So our preliminary take-home messages here are that these short-lived um, grasses, like cheatgrass, annual grasses, are the most common non-native invaders to establish after fires in the West from these data. Um, and post-fire invasion of these non-native short-lived grasses is sort of confined to a specific climate space. It's climate space may change as the climate changes. So risk of post-fire plant invasions may change as well. And I think we can map these current and future relationships between plant invasion and these climate variables, you know, as well as the large uncertainty around them to help focus current and future management. Um, and then lastly, I'll just focus, <laughs> note that everything about this collection of data is really unevenly sampled and haphazard. So all the conclusions we draw need to be really heavily cautioned. Um, but I think the synthesis is important because it shows where data gaps exist that can hinder the accurate assessment of post-fire invasion risk across you know, a gradient of ecosystem types um, and hopefully show where more data are needed in the future uh, to direct research and management. I think that is it. Great, thank you so much, Janet. Um, we'll move on to our last speaker and then we'll do our Q&A. So for our last speaker, we'll have Dr. Dana Blumenthal, who is a research ecologist at USDA. And Dana will be talking about tar targeted grazing of cheatgrass, how to close its phenological niche in the Western Great Plains. So I'll hand over to Dana. All right, I'm working on the screen share here. One sec.
All right. Um, if that worked the way I think it did, you are now seeing a slide of cattle in cheatgrass. Yes. And you're not Agreed. seeing notes and things. No notes, just the slides. Okay, good. Um, well, hi everyone. Um, I'm really happy to get a chance to talk with you and I really appreciate um, everyone's work at risk for putting on this workshop and, and I appreciate the invitation, so thanks so much. Um, I need all of these 10 minutes, so I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, for the last four years or so, we have been studying early season targeted grazing of cheatgrass as a way um, both of controlling cheatgrass in general, but also as a way of adapting for, to climate change. Before getting into that, I wanna back up in time a little bit and tell you about um, how we got into this work. That started in 2011, when we first started studying cheatgrass in the prairie heating and CO2 enrichment study. Um, one more quick question, can you guys see my cursor? Can you move it again? Oh yes, I do see it. Okay, I think I have to have it on this screen for you to see it. Sorry about that. Okay, so the prairie heating and CO2 enrichment experiment is um, a large global change experiment. It's no longer running, but it was, the goal of it is to, to expose native mixed grass prairie to future environmental conditions in terms of both warming and CO2 enrichment. And both in 20, using this study to um, study how um, cheatgrass would respond to these global changes. And what we did was um, we planted it both into these disturbed strips here and into the green uh, intact prairie. We did it two years running and I'm not gonna go into any more details. I'm just gonna show you the results. So what we found was that warming um, increases cheatgrass biomass very consistently, approximately fourfold. Um, if you look at these graphs, what you can see is cheatgrass biomass, that's the full bars, cheatgrass seed set, those are the inset hatched bars in four different climate treats, treatments, control in gray, warming in red, elevated CO2 in blue, and purple is the combination of CO2 and warming. We did this in two years, a wet year and a dry year. We did this with low competition and high competition. In all cases, warming really, really favored cheatgrass. Um, this was a surprise to me. I expected um, warming to dry things out, which it did, um, and perhaps inhibit cheatgrass, which it didn't. And what it suggests is that cheatgrass is really more strongly influenced by temperature, more strongly limited by temperature in this system than by water. Looking for an explanation to that, it seems to me that what's going on is that warming is expanding cheatgrass's phenological niche. Um, now, as you all probably know cheatgrass has an unusual, unusual phenological niche in this part of the world. It grows in the fall and early spring when many other things are dormant. And what warming is doing is it's making more days suitable for cheatgrass growth during that unusual phenological niche. So these results got us thinking, what could we do about this from a management perspective? Is there a way that we could make this strategy that cheatgrass takes, this phenological strategy, less effective? And the main way we been pursuing is targeted early season grazing. Now, um, the mixed grass prairie is the largest remaining grassland in North America. Almost all of it is grazed. Most of that is by cattle. And um, the way it currently works is that the cattle go into pastures, at least in this part of the mixed grass prairie, they go into pastures in early June. That's about when cheatgrass is finishing up its life cycle. So cheatgrass mostly avoids being eaten and um, then the cattle come in and they graze the native species for the rest of the summer. If we can switch that timing around so that the cattle graze early and the native species are released later, we should be able to alter the balance of competition. That's the idea. It's not at all a new idea, um, but it is likely to be more important with climate change. Um, it may also work better with climate change because warmer temperatures allows cattle, allow cattle to be out on pastures earlier in the year. Um, it should also work well in the Western Great Plains, and there's two reasons for that. First, our grasses are very well adapted to grazing. And second of all, um, the uh, phenological niche difference between the natives and the uh, and cheatgrass is really quite large, so there's something to work with there. Um, that said, it's not necessarily easy. Here's a storm that we ran into in May 2017. This sort of thing can be very difficult for uh, ranchers. Um, it, sometimes it can coincide with calving, making it more difficult. 
Sometimes there can be issues with um, in, in poisonous plants. So, so there's costs as well as benefits. And if you wanna be able to um, use this technique effectively, you need to really know how to target your grazing. When exactly will cattle select for cheatgrass? And that's what we set out to study. This was our conceptual model. We figured that as cheatgrass starts growing, it'll get taller over time. Eventually it'll get tall enough that cows will start eating it. At some point it'll mature and they'll decide it's not yummy again and they'll stop eating it. If we could, if we could get our handle on that grazing window, if we can really figure out when it is, we can improve cheatgrass management accordingly. So we've been studying this at two sites, one in Cheyenne, Wyoming, the other near Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, with our collaborator, Mitch Stevenson from the University of Nebraska. At each site, we mapped the cheatgrass, that's the area in green here, and then we created 10 acre pastures that were about half cheatgrass. Those pastures we grazed for four years, we grazed them from late April until the cheatgrass turned brown. And then we measured a variety of variables, the most important of which was um, cattle consumption of cheatgrass. This we measured using um, genetic analysis of chloroplast DNA from fecal samples. So if you amp amplify that DNA from the fecal samples, you can get a pretty good idea of how much of what the cattle were eating. We also monitored, monitored cattle to grazing activity. And then we measured a variety of things about the plants with the goal of predicting the consumption of cheatgrass. Here's what the consumption uh, data look like. This is for the first three years of the study at the Nebraska site. Um, you can see the red line is consumption as a proportion of graminoids consumed. It tends to increase sometime in May, between early and late May, it goes along high for a while, and then it declines sometime in June and July. Those start and end dates actually vary quite a bit. This is what we expected. Um, and our real goal was to see if we could predict those patterns. So to predict those patterns, we looked at three primary variables, the height of the cheatgrass, its flowering date, specifically how many days before or after flowering a particular sample was taken, and forage quality. And the answer, without going into any of the modeling, is that you can do a good job, a very good job really, of predicting how much cheatgrass cattle will eat if you know the height and the flowering date of the cheatgrass. So this was exciting to us. Um, we also learned that flowering date and forage quality are telling us almost exactly the same thing in this study. So here we have days before and after flowering on the X axis. We have crude protein on the Y axis and we have very high R squared values. Essentially, as this plant matures, forage quality declines linearly and extremely consistent across year, consistently across years and sites. Um, so, that's probably why flowering date was important in our models. And it's very handy because flowering date is easy to measure and forage quality much more difficult to measure. Now, what we really wanted to do with this was to figure out how to predict a grazing window. How can we figure out when cattle ought to be grazing cheatgrass? And to do this, we took a step backwards and we used the flowering date and the um, height data from each year to create predicted grazing, uh, sorry, predicted consumption. And those the, our predictions based on mixed modeling are the squiggly lines here. And they're set against the actual observed values from the genetic analysis, which are the points. And you can see that they line up pretty well. Essentially, that's just a demonstration that again, that we can do a good job with the prediction. Um, so then using those predicted values, we wanted to create grazing windows times when we would suggest that cattle should graze cheatgrass. And we simply said, if, the, if it's 75% or more of the maximum for that year, we'll call it a grazing window. And that's the bars that you see along the tops of these graphs. You can see that the grazing windows that we suggest vary quite a bit in when they start and when they end. And that has to do with when cheatgrass reaches those phenological stages. They're actually quite consistent if you, um, look into the, where they fall with respect to phenology. Typically, those grazing windows start when cheatgrass is around nine centimeters tall and they go to about 28 days after it's done flowering. So there's the prescription that we were after. Very quickly, a couple of other pieces of data. We see the same sort of patterns when we look at the spatial data. So here's that same map with cheatgrass in green. And what you can see is the grazing locations in um, May, which are in blue on the left, are um, really focused on the cheatgrass patches early. If 
fast forward a bit to July, uh, June that same year when cheatgrass is pretty far along and they're assiduously avoiding the cheatgrass. So this is exciting because what it shows us is that the cattle aren't just eating the cheatgrass because they're there, they're actually searching it out. And in a larger pasture where cattle have a lot of choice, that could be important. One final graph and then I'll uh, be done here. Um, so this is cheatgrass seed set inside and outside those pastures. Um, and what we found was that the early spring grazing compared to the summer grazing outside led to substantial reductions in seed set every year at both sites. Um, and you can see that here with the red cheatgrass in the foreground. So another encouraging result. I'm gonna skip over the conclusions so that I can point out to you that I was not the only person to do this work. I had a lot of help. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much, Dana, and to all of our speakers. I know we're running a little bit short on time, but how about we take one or two questions now? Um, people have any raise hand questions or otherwise, otherwise I know we have a few in the chat. Um, I guess what, the one for Janet was, um, you may have addressed this, but how will the connection between the research result and land managers be made? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I was trying to address it and then my dog was trying to address me, so I might have glossed over it. Um, I think the idea will be to eventually have an online tool that managers can use for current and future um, invasion risk and hopefully the kind of tool that can update with more information as we get it. Perhaps linked to the Inhabit website that is also um, already online and used by managers. All right, if anyone has um, another question, um, I have one for Dana, actually. I was kind of wondering how many um, generations of targeted grazing you think it would take to eliminate cheatgrass from the seed bank. That's probably a hard question without studying it, but if you had a, a gut feeling. Yeah, um, that's a very good question because it's gonna come up, right? People are gonna wanna know, you know, I, should I use this or should I spray, spray, spray plateau or what? Um, the answer is it's not gonna eliminate it. Um, you can't you can't get all the cheatgrass the way you can with herbicide, and it really would have to be used as an integral part of a grazing management system. So you can knock it back a lot. That's what we've shown so far, and we have another study that we're starting this year to learn how much can we knock it back, how quickly, and what happens to the natives. Um, I didn't have time to show any of that, but um, the hope is because you can get reasonable cattle weight gains. Also, data that we didn't show that this can be something that will be a win-win for producers and that they can use this not every year, but on a regular basis to um, reduce cheatgrass abundance rather than eliminate it. 